337? That's incorrect. It's 380. There's within my heart melody. <laughs>
Amen. <clears throat> I'd like you to join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, <clears throat>
put flowers and markers and remember everybody that is buried in cemeteries, which is is all right, but remember that the, the original starting of Decoration Day was started in the Civil War by <coughs> several different groups. And uh, the, histori the historians all disagree about which, which, who gets to be first as to whether they did it first or somebody else. But apparently in Charleston, uh, South Carolina, uh, in May or July, I'm not sure exactly, June or July, uh, there was a uh, group of uh, freed slaves that uh, gathered <coughs> together and uh, went <coughs> to a... Uh, uh, cemetery, actually a mass grave burial site for Union soldiers that were captured, were prisoners of war, that, were, that died, in, and they buried them in a mass grave, and <clears throat> these uh, freed men and, uh, decided to dig all the bones up, and they buried them and marked the grave. Of course, they had nothing else, they didn't know who was who, but they marked the graves as Civil War Union soldiers that had died in, during the Civil War. And if you don't know, the Civil War is the, is the bloodiest war of all of, of all time in the United States. Uh, over 600,000 men and women died during that conflict. Now, if you, if that sounds like that's a lot of people, but you've got to remember that only just barely over a million people, men and women, have died in all the wars that the United States has fought in. And so over half of them died in one war, the Civil War. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, the freedmen buried these uh, folks and uh, buried the men that had been in that prisoner of war camp. And they then a freedmen uh, school uh, full of, and of course, down the market, I'm going to read from the Gazette, uh, the South Carolina Gazette. And they, they said, Colored children, 2,800 of them, marched across the graves and threw flowers on the graves. And uh, that was the, supposedly the first Decoration Day. And it happened in 1960, I mean 1865, right after uh, the assassination of Lincoln and at the end of the, after the war had ended. So this is, that began the, so the Decoration Day and several different things came along and and uh, President Johnson uh, declared it to be a decoration day in uh, 1867, and, and different different uh, presidents have came on since then. But anyway, it uh, <coughs> was originally known as Decoration Day and originated after the Civil War to commemorate both the Union and Confederate soldiers who died in the Civil War. By the 20th century, though, Memorial Day has been extended to honor all Americans who have died while it military service. So it began as a civil war for the Union and Confederate soldiers and became for all that died in the military. So just so that you know, I'd like the people that men that are here or women, you've ever served in the in the military, please stand up. Bill, you can stand up. I know you did. So. <laughs> But I'm still, I'm already standing, so I'm not going to stand up again. But I just want you to know that, that every time I, uh, somebody comes up to me that was served in Vietnam, but they'll come up to me and they'll shake my hand because they know that I was there. And they'll say, uh, they'll say to me, and I say the same thing, <clears throat> glad you made it back. Because <clears throat> not everybody makes it back. And <clears throat> so when it comes to Memorial Day, Decoration Day, I'm always happy to be decorating the graves instead of having my grave decorated. So those are the kinds of things that happen. I uh, would like to, you know, it's held in, it's not to be confused with Veterans Day, which is held in in uh, November, which is for all veterans, not just the ones that have died. But Memorial Day is actually for the ones that have passed on, that were killed in action or died while in the service of the country. And the, <clears throat> the graves in Ar Arlington National Cemetery are, were, uh, are marked with a flag all over. In most of the cemeteries, the American Legion or the VFW comes by and puts a flag on every American soldier <clears throat> that's, <coughs> that's buried there. 
whether they died during peacetime or, or, or you know, or died during a conflict or uh, passed on after they returned from, from the service. And uh, the 3rd Infantry Division, and I didn't know this till this weekend, is uh, marks all of the graves in Arlington, which is quite a, a feat. 300,000 graves are there, buried there. And uh, the 3rd Infantry Division, which is the longest continuous serving uh, infantry division in the, in the United States Army, marks all of those graves. It takes a couple of days to do that, so I, uh, okay. Uh, they, uh, I'd like to read you from some of the some of the presidents that have uh, that have uh, uh, talked about Memorial Day. So, presidents that have spoken on Memorial Day and they seem to all talk about God. And it seems to be kind of a situation of uh, God and country. And it seems to be that, you know, the United States is, is a blessed country. And if you don't believe that, travel to a third world country, you'll really know how blessed you are here. It's a really different, different in a lot of other places. It's not the same. But anyway, throughout American history, presidents have often used religious uh, Rhetoric for various reasons to provide comfort and consolation, argue that God directs our nation, celebrates our Christian heritage, defend our democracy, hold citizens and the country accountable for transcendent standards, help accomplish their own political aims, and justify America's actions. They foster traditional morality and justice, and they promote prayer and Bible reading, and they call for national and individual repentance. And they want to unite Americans and satisfy citizens' expectations. Presidents have used it to reassure citizens that God rules the universe and love them as they fought enemies in the War of 1812, the Spanish American War, the Civil War, World War II, one and two, and combined aggressions in Vietnam, now in Afghanistan and Iraq. But we presidents talk about our commitment. To God and to country for that. Uh, Benjamin Harrison first recognized, recognized Decoration Day in 1891, and presidents have consistently issued Memorial Day statements since 1929. Their declarations have typically asked God to bless those who died defending the nation and have urged Americans to pray and work for peace. Reflecting on the outcome of the Civil War, Harrison argued in a May 30th, 1891 speech at Independence Hall in Philadelphia that Americans had settled perfectly the question of loyal submission to the Constitution and the law in all the states. He proclaimed that we honor those who died in the service of our country and joyfully and thankfully commemorate what they did. We mourn for them as comrades who have departed, but the glory of their achievement has given them imperishable honor. And I would argue that he's wrong, that there's still people that would like to separate from the United States at uh, different times. We've heard that, I remember one time there was a, a movement in, uh, to, uh, to uh, just to make a new state in between Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas because Western Kansas wasn't being represented. But there's also always, there's separatists that still think that they can leave the United States. By the way, it's against the law to leave the United States. If you want to pack your, if you want to pack your state up and move to another country, you can't. It's not. It's not legal. And as we did in the Civil War, we went. They, there was a fight over that. So, and after World War II, Harry Truman declared in 1948 that Memorial Day provided an appropriate occasion for Americans who have been long devoted to furthering peace to reflect about the human losses resulting from the ravages of war. Remembering beloved friends and relatives who were sacrificed in the ordeal of battle should inspire citizens to redouble their exertions in a, in a mighty striving for the long sought basis of an unbreakable righteous peace. And he urged Americans to acknowledge our need for God's divine guidance and to pray that permanent peace may prevail among men. And I'd echo those, those oaths and prayers that we could have perpetual peace. Just so, uh, in 
As the Cold War neared its end, President Ronald Reagan asserted that any American who has ever listened to a bugler sound taps, <clears throat> yeah, I'm sorry, I got cold. Uh, whether it was halfway around the world or on a lonely tarmac stateside, knows that why we set aside a special day each year to honor those who have died for our country and to pray for permanent peace. We do so, Reagan explained, for the sons and daughters of our land who have perished in the cause of liberty. We do so to honor the nation that gave them the birthright of freedom and to revere, defend, and preserve all those brave heroes and heroines who have given their lives to make the nation secure. And I like those little remarks that, man, every time I hear that, it just, it's emotion. It's, uh, it's, it's really, uh, <clears throat> if you go to, if you, to a fallen comrade's uh, funeral and they, and, uh, they play taps, it brings tears to my eyes and kind of makes me rub, think about how lucky I was. And as I, as I say that to my brothers, and, and we, I see them, and I'm glad you made it back. Because <clears throat> being halfway around the world, is, as some of you know, is, is not the same as being here. There's a lot of things that are different. And, uh, in, the war, in the war zone, it's even different, more different than that. And I've often said, thought I'd like to go back to Vietnam and see it without Constantine wire and sandbags everywhere, because that's what I saw. There wasn't a lot of, a lot of agriculture going on. There wasn't a lot of, they, you know, I saw lots of rice paddies, but they weren't being farmed because it was just dangerous to, to be a farmer there. So if you think about <clears throat> the, your ability to be a farmer here, or a worker, or, or a student, you know, you have a lot of freedoms, and you can thank uh, a lot of men and women who fought and died for you, you know, so that you have lots of freedoms. Excuse me. <clears throat> I gotta get a drink. Sorry. <laughs> And when I think of freedom, I think of a second lieutenant named James Rao. James Rao was captured on uh, November 29, 1963, in at Kamau in South South Vietnam. It's right on the very tip of Vietnam, uh, right next to the, the Sea of Thailand. And he was a second lieutenant. Special Forces officer in Vietnam in 1963, which was really, really early in the Vietnam conflict, if you, if you know your history. And uh, he was captured. And uh, uh, four and a half years later, I'm in Vietnam. I, I just get there. I get there in, in July of 68. So I'm there four and a half years after he he was had been captured. And all this time, he's in living in a bamboo cage at night being eaten by mosquitoes, and I mean, those mosquitoes are already left us there. And uh, eating fish heads and rice, on a lucky day he got fish heads, right? And he got rice to eat. <clears throat> and uh, and when I got there, we, uh, I didn't know anything about him, and, but the people that I worked with uh, did, and we, we were on several operations, four or five that I can recall, trying to get him. We knew where he was at. But you know, they moved him, kept moving him every night, and they moved him to a different place, and they're really hard to, to get him out without, without <coughs> killing him, you know, us doing a lot of things. So, anyway, we missed him, and missed him, and missed him. And one time, uh, I remember uh, Mike Lester told me, he said, We missed him by an hour. So, <coughs> anyway, he said, uh, He said, I'm not leaving Vietnam until we get him out. I thought that was pretty pretty strange, but anyway, at that time. And anyway, on January 1st, 1969, which was, by the way, that's a holiday, and I, ever, even in Vietnam, in America, we, were, we had the day off, right? Well, we didn't have the day off. They got us up, said, you have to fly. And I said, well, it's our day off. You know? In case you don't know, I was a, a Huey uh, Creech Chief door gunner on, on the UH-1 helicopter. And they said, you got to get up and fly. Of course, they wouldn't tell us. They said, you got to go. you got to go do something. So we got in our hel got the helicopter all the time. And we took off and we flew about 30 minutes to a place called Sok Train. And, 
and a guy jumped on this helicopter, and his name was James Rao. And <clears throat> he escaped that morning because uh, the B-52s that came from Guam and bombed the UN Forest Triple Crack Canopy Forest in South Vietnam that, uh, uh, I mean, you can't see this triple canopy. It's pretty dark at the bottom. Anyway, he had escaped because the bombs were being dropped right where he was at. And he was manning the radios and told them, said, hey, they're going to bomb us right here. And everybody scattered and he escaped. And uh, he was in black pajamas and he, uh, uh, a gunship, another helicopter, not mine, was flew in on him and saw him and, and they were going to shoot him because he was not dressed in American clothes. But he kept, he was waving at him and waving at him and, and, and to that, that uh, uh, aircraft commander's credit, he did not shoot him. He thought, this is strange, this is different. So he landed and, and uh, he jumped on the helicopter and his words were to them was, Lieutenant James Rowe reporting for duty. <coughs> now, he got on our helicopter and his eyes were dancing, sparkling, and I'm sorry, I can't tell this story without getting all choked up. Because he was the happiest person I have ever, ever, ever seen. And so, when you think about freedom, I think of James Rowe. And uh, I think about him as a person that endured a lot, and, but still had the faith and thought he would one day escape and get out. And he did. So we, that's why, that's a day that I never forget. And I've got a lot of days that I don't forget in Vietnam, but that one really struck me and still strikes me today as I think about people. You know, and we have freedoms that sometimes we don't, we don't always appreciate. But James Rao did, and he wanted to return to that. So anyway, that's my story. Uh, I just, uh, like I said, I can't tell the story hardly without choking up. I don't tell it very often because of that. <clears throat> it's been, what, 40 years, and I, or 45, and I still, still, the, still makes me, uh, makes me happy that he got away, but still can't tell the story about choking up. He wrote a book, it's called Five Years of Freedom, and if you have ever seen it somewhere, you want to read about it, you can read about his story. He tells about the first night he was in the bamboo cage, with his knees and his chin. That's how tight it was in that bamboo cage. And the mosquitoes relentlessly attacked me all night long. Thirty days, it was thirty days before he could not feel those mosquitoes bite him. So, but anyway, um, appreciate all of you listening. And I hope that today, when you, when you, or tomorrow, when you go to decorate a grave, you think about those kinds of people that did a lot so that you can do virtually anything you want to do. You want to be a person, you want to do something, you can do that because of men and women who served and died for you. And there's another guy that died for you. His name is Jesus Christ. And uh, I want you to remember that he was a prisoner and was executed for you so that you may Enjoy ever lasting life. If you'll join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we remember those who have made the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms we enjoy every day, we think of how they have followed in the footsteps of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Please hold our servicemen and women in your strong arms. Cover them with your shelter and grace and your presence as they stand in the gap for our protection. We also remember the families of our troops. We ask for your unique blessings to fill their homes, and we pray your peace, provision, and strength will fill their lives. May the members of our armed forces be supplied with courage to face each day, and may they trust in the Lord's mighty power to accomplish each task. Let our military brothers and sisters feel our love and support. In the name of Jesus, amen.
We have the offering prayer. Hearing God, when we went astray, you purified us with fire and washed us clean in the waters of our baptism. You grant us in thanks for your constant care and your many blessings. You return the gifts to you that they may be used to bring hope and light to the world in need.
We search in front of the God in the darkness. Now we shine in the glorious light, knowing that God goes with us. Once we wandered with the delusion that God was far from us. Now we abide in the truth. In God we live and we move and have our being. Once we felt isolated and alone. Now we know that the advocate, the spirit of truth, guides our hearts and minds, growing within us and in communion with God and one with one another. <clears throat> the people of God said, Amen. Amen.